Coming up on DTNS, facts about Bitcoin energy use. The FTC comes after the right to repair, and Twitter opens a tip jar. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 7th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Green Screen Lane, I'm Lamar Wilson. Tron the Top Tech Stories. From Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just debating singles or cassette singles on Good Day Internet. Uh, we also were talking about oh, good old-fashioned video game shows and tip lines. That's all there on Good Day Internet. If you want to get it, become a member. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. On May 15th, WhatsApp's previously delayed privacy policy goes live. For those who don't accept the new terms, WhatsApp says after a period of several weeks, reminders about the new policy will become persistent and users will lose access to their chat list, although they'll still be able to be able to answer incoming phone and video calls and get notifications about messages or missed calls. After those few weeks of limited functionality, however, WhatsApp will stop sending calls and messages to your device. So they just slowly annoy you to, to death. <laughs> uh, Amazon will add compatible Echo speakers and Echo Show smart displays to its Sidewalk network on June 8th and start onboarding select third-party device partners such as tile trackers the following week. The idea is these devices all make the network stronger by, by contributing to it. Sidewalk will support level smart locks by late May, and Amazon is launching a Sidewalk pilot program for CareBand's elder care wearable devices. According to a report by Flurry Analytics, roughly 11% of daily global iOS users opted into allowing apps access to their identifier for advertisers tag, which is part of Apple's app tracking transparency tool introduced in iOS 14.5. So most users appear to be actively op opting out of tracking requests, with only 4% of surveyed users disabling the allow apps to request to track option in their settings. We may have to plan a memorial for the death of yet another Windows variant. Petri is reporting that Microsoft won't ship Windows 10X this year and likely never will at least in its current form. Windows 10X was originally touted as a lightweight, simplified version of Windows running on dual screen devices like the Surface Neo. But over the last year, Microsoft has pivoted to running Windows 10X on single screen devices and trying to kind of position it as a functionality rivaling Chrome OS. Apple's App Store Vice President Matt Fisher testified in the Apple versus Epic trial about why Apple requires digital sales to use Apple payment systems and not give up and give up 30% of the sale, giving it up to Apple, of course, while physical sales like eBay don't. What's the deal? Well, Fisher said the difference was that Apple has no involvement in the delivery of physical goods, but digital goods are handled by the operating system, saying Apple, quote, enables the safe and frictionless delivery of digital goods from a developer to a user. All right. Let's talk about that Twitter tip jar, Sarah. Let's do it. Twitter launched a tip jar function for a limited number of select accounts. I am not one of them, at least as of this recording. Twitter says it's made up of creators, journalists, experts, and nonprofits. A tip jar icon will show up on those accounts on their profile page. It's pretty cut and dry, at least to know if you've got it or not. Users with the ability to receive tips can choose to receive them through Bandcamp, Cash App, Patreon, PayPal, and Venmo. Got some options there. Android can also handle tips in Twitter's Spaces audio feature. The company says it's not taking a cut of the tips. That is a little different than how some other companies work that have similar functionality. Anyone using Twitter in English on Android or iOS can send tips as well. Now, several privacy researchers noted that if you're sending money to a Twitter user using PayPal, you may also be sending your address, your physical address. This is clear during the process but not everyone's paying attention because they don't realize that they're giving up that information. This is because PayPal has the option of receiving money from friends and family, which doesn't include an address, or goods and services, which does need an address because you're shipping something. Business accounts defaults to goods and services. Twitter is updating the tip tipping prompt to make that more clear. Yeah, so first of all, whenever you're using PayPal to pay for something, pay attention to all the words on the screen. Because if your address is there, that means your address is being sent to the people on the other end. Uh, but but yeah, this is uh, that, that that caused a little consternation. Uh, I 
I would like to not have to give my physical address to Twitter uh, or to a person that I'm donating to uh, if, if I'm if I'm sending them money. Uh, but I understand why this happened. So hopefully Twitter and PayPal can can work this out so that it doesn't happen. Uh, maybe just switch everybody to friends and family, even if they're a business. That'd be great. Let's do that. Uh, on on the Twitter tip jar side of this, I feel like this this is a test. So they could either start taking a cut later on, or they might package this in as part of a subscription service for creators. Like you'll get analytics and some extra features and, and maybe some promotion, you know, for $9.99 a month, plus you'll be able to take tips. And so they wouldn't take a cut of the tips, but they would be make it part of a paid service. I could see them doing something like that down the road. Lamar, you're, you're a creator like the rest of us here. Uh, what do you think of this? No, I I think your uh your your thought process is is correct uh, on this. I was it was weird like like Sarah was thinking like wait what what what's the catch here? Why are they not taking a a, a cut? And so uh, I think of the forthcoming service will probably be the way they 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 get their money. But as a creator, will I use this? I I, I I'm torn because. I don't see any harm in enabling it. I know a couple of creators were like, oh, this is going to turn into OnlyFans or something. And I was, and I was like, well, you know, I, there's people who, who are very helpful on Twitter. And that's one of the yeah. scenarios. Where like, you know, like, hey, I had a problem. That, you know, this person went through several tweets to help me. I want to give them something in return. Uh, sometimes I'll send people Amazon gift cards or DMs or whatever. Uh, but yeah, th this would be a, a really, really cool way to, to to do that. Just say, hey, you know, thanks for taking you know, 30 minutes out of your time to, to help me. So, you know, and, and vice versa. I, I don't see a problem having it enabled. It just, it feel, it will feel a little weird at first to me. You know, there's a, there's a good example of, of this functionality being built right into Twitter because some people, as we all know, it's like, you've got a big presence on Twitter. Not everybody does, but some people, and they've taken years to get to that point. And so, and we've had this conversation before where it's like, well, Twitter often serves as a promotional tool to click the link and then read my longer Substack article about this thing that I talked about briefly on Twitter. But some people are pretty much on Twitter as their platform. And there's a mm -hmm. woman who's somewhat local in my area who is very, very active during California fire season. You know, she's kind of on the ground. She's kind of a fire chaser. She's got really good information and all of her updates come through Twitter. And occasionally, I saw it last year when we were sort of at the height of a bunch of problems, she would occasionally pepper in like, hey, I'm doing this for free. If you want to support me at all, I think it was like a PayPal link or something like that. And I remember thinking, you know, I gave her some money. I remember thinking, yeah, I, I, I totally feel like she deserves this. And this is kind of where she's interfacing with the rest mm -hmm. of us. Tip jar is perfect for people like that. Yeah. yeah. Also, the, the integration with Bandcamp and Patreon, I, I think, should not go unnoted uh, because, mm. I mean, for us, Daily Tech News Show, we'd obviously, you know, if we're ever included in this, uh, hook up the Patreon. Why not? Like, that that's how we fund yeah. the show. And I could see musicians doing this as well. We're like, oh, yeah, no, Bandcamp is, is, is how we make our money. So tie that into our Twitter account. That, that's kind of a no-brainer. So it's interesting to see them doing a variety of these things. So it's all not just the tip jar, per se, way of yeah. funding. I tip you, Tom. Oh, I, I tip my cap to you as well. <laughs> uh, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, a.k.a. FTC, has issued a report on how manufacturers deal with product repairs. The report details anti-competitive practices from things like making spare parts unavailable to limiting access to diagnostic software to actually designing products to make repairs more difficult or even unsafe to attempt, whether on purpose or not. Manufacturers also use things like software locks, warnings against using non-original parts, and enforcements of EULAs to dissuade repair. The FTC report says, and I quote, There is scant evidence to support manufacturers' justifications for repair restrictions. Adding that, the majority of manufacturers' explanations for repair restrictions are not supported by the record. So when you hear everybody saying like, oh no, it's for your security and safety, the FTC is saying no. As far as we can tell, it's not. The FTC recommended the potential launch of a repairability score program, like one introduced in France, as well as new rules and potentially new laws surrounding repairs. But most of all, the FTC wants better enforcement of the existing Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. That law says that if there is a term that's vague in a warranty, you construe it against the drafter of the warranty in favor of the user. 
So if there's if it's unclear who benefits, the user benefits. Also, warranters cannot require branded parts. Warranters cannot decline coverage because of a previous unrelated repair. So if, if you replace the screen in your phone and then your modem goes bad, Apple can't say like, man, you replaced the screen, that voids your warranty, unless they can prove that the screen repair somehow ruined the modem, which would be very difficult. The law says you can open your electronics without voiding the entire warranty, even if there's a sticker there implying otherwise. The FTC wants customers to report such violations of existing law at reportfraud.ftc.gov. Now, let's see, my thinking of this, of being kind of pro, you know, go, going with the warranty companies and all that is like, hey, if I open my iMac, you know, and I screw something up, you know, like that's that's on me. Should Apple have to cover my my mess? But as as you read along, it, it's it, I'm I'm still a little iffy on that one. But it, you know, but it, it it does say if it's vague, you know, on on the terms that it go it sides with the with the user. But it doesn't yeah. really talk about you know if you just go in there and just you don't know what you're doing. I think that's what initially exactly. was. Yeah. Opening the case doesn't void your warranty. What the what the law says is if you open the case and like take a screwdriver to the modem and then take it in under warranty and they're like, you broke it, then no, the warranty isn't allowed to cover that. But if you open the case and fix the fan and then your screen breaks later, they can't say, well, you open the case. We're not going to fix your screen because those see. are unrelated. I see. Yeah. yeah, it would be a very, the company would have to really have a good case saying because of updating your fan you've now killed your screen right i mean that would that would have to be something you would have to know when buying the product in the first place and the burden of proof would be on them to show that your repair caused the problem with the screen not on you right it's on them yeah yeah exactly all right well thanks to open by you who tipped us off to the story on our subreddit i thought this is really interesting jefferson parish public schools in louisiana are taking applications for an entirely virtual high school for the 2021 to 2022 school year, any student in Jefferson Parish grades 9 through 12 can apply to attend Jefferson Virtual High School, or JVHS. Applications will be accepted through May 16th. The district will look for students who have good self-discipline and are self-motivated, so I won't be a part of this. Uh, accepted students will receive a laptop, but must provide their own internet connection. JVHS will have no extracurricular activities like music or athletics. So, I mean... Not even, not even chess or Fortnite team athletics or something. I mean, there there might be music <laughs> classes that are part of the regular curriculum, but they won't have the like you know the the after school versions uh, of those activities. Yeah. Uh, and that's because what they're saying is, hey, we learned a lot during the pandemic about virtual school. We learned which students might be good at that, which it might be beneficial for, uh, and so we're we're going to offer that. I, I I think that this is excellent. Which is not oh. saying like let's make all schools virtual. It's saying, hey, this works for some people, so let's make it available to those people. Yeah, I was I was real quick. I, I I really I was being silly before, but I, like I really am promoter of this because the reality is some some kids really thrive from working uh, or schooling from home. Like there is no in-person bullying, no teasing, not, none of the pressure to wear the latest clothes or, you know, sit by the coolest, you know, students at lunch, you know, they, they, they were, they were able to like, just kind of have a peaceful time to, to study and, and, and enhance themselves. So I think uh, besides the self-motivated and self-generated ones, there, there are some, you know, just by the abuses that you have to deal with school. And we all have, have at least, if not dealt with it, have seen it uh, with other kids. Like, I think it could be very beneficial for those kids to give them the option. It's like, man, I had a good year. I don't want to go back. I mean, I'm seeing that on Twitter or in my comments. You know, I've done live shows and kids are like, yeah, I don't, I don't you know, yeah, I was, it was peaceful. I mean, I had no drama. I want to stay home. Well, I mean, and I, I don't know. It, there have been so many stories I've listened to on, you know, various podcasts and radio programs about, uh, the huge, you know, the, the, it, there's the spectrum of kids who do well in distance learning versus kids who don't do well. I mean, it's, it's like learning in general. I mean, people learn differently their entire lives, but certainly when you're a kid and you're starting to cram, you know, a lot of knowledge, uh, into, into a young person's brain. Yeah. I mean, for the kids who are, you know, they just flourish in situations where they have, you know, maybe a little more peace and quiet, less distraction. Uh, it, it just, it just depends. This could be a great option, not for every kid. 
Um, but but uh, yeah, I mean, there's certain kids who were like, I'm not an athletic kid. The fact that my school wouldn't have athletics is doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I mean, I would have been that kid. Yeah. Although I think they could do esports, right? You know. <laughs> yeah. Or I mean, I I think there's just there's a lot of that like camaraderie and being around a bunch of other kids and running around and having lunch together and stuff. It's like, yeah, lots of kids do like that. Lots yeah. of kids really have missed that, but not every kid. This could be Very really good. advantageous to some. Yeah. And I think that's what's interesting about this is is that they're saying we we're going we're not getting rid of in-person education for some kids that's better and we're going to keep it yeah. for that we're going to but we're going to try to identify those who thrive with the virtual and and make that available mm -hmm. as well I'm, I'm interested in how they pick the teachers for this there wasn't a lot of detail in this uh, article uh, about that because that is also a skill being able to teach virtually mm -hmm. as well yeah they're still right, working on it right. yeah yeah uh, folks, if you have thoughts on uh, virtual uh, teaching, uh, get into our virtual conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. We've been looking for good studies on the energy usage of cryptocurrency, and while this is not a study, Harvard Business Review's Nick Carter has an excellent write-up of what the issues are. Uh, it's worth a read. The Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance estimates Bitcoin consumers uh, or, or that Bitcoin consumes about 110 terawatt hours per year. Uh, that's about 0.55 percent of global electricity production. I, I see all kinds of comparisons that make it sound worse than that. Uh, also, you shouldn't think that 0.55 percent is nothing because like one one activity is. Uh, creates a, a nice niche. But that's what I like about this story is it puts it in perspective. Like, here's the actual number. Carter notes that whether that is too much or not depends on how you value the utility of cryptocurrency. If you think of it as a device for criminals to launder money and buy drugs, then it looks like an irresponsible waste. However, if you use Bitcoin to escape oppression, which many people do, or avoid inflation in your country, especially if your country has a volatile economy, then this looks like a bargain to you. In most of the article, though, Carter focuses on how Bitcoin uses energy and offers explanations to help you form your own opinion. The first thing to consider is what kind of energy Bitcoin is using, and that's difficult to know. Could be solar, wind, hydro, coal, gas, or oil, because miners don't make their operations transparent. We don't know. There are lots of miners in Scandinavia and Southwest China, and both of those areas have a lot of hydropower. So you could make a guess that maybe they're using hydropower. CoinShares estimates that 73% of Bitcoin is renewable power, while CCAF puts it at 39%. So there's really just no good way of getting an accurate number. The power makeup may change too. Some miners are locating their mining near power sources to take advantage of energy that would otherwise be wasted, such as hydropower during wet seasons or natural gas that's expelled during oil extraction. And there are a growing number of Bitcoin mining operations in North Dakota and Siberia uh, that are happening for exactly those reasons. They're near what would otherwise be wasted energy. Carter also notes that most of the energy used from Bitcoin comes from mining. The energy used in transactions is minimal. The number of coins a miner can mint is halved every year. So mining will decline. So when you look at projections, there was a famous one in the New York Times. Those projections are acting as if Bitcoin will just continue to grow at the rate it has. And that's probably not going to happen. Uh, there is a way that Bitcoin can be powered on renewables and used for legitimate purposes, but that is not guaranteed. I found this article mm. very helpful in sort of trying to wrap my head about what the risk actually is. Yeah, I've been trying to... Uh, I'm, I'm very ignorant when it comes to crypto. So when, when you, when you mention mining and i've heard that term before I, I i i can't wrap my head around what that is do you, do you have like a explanation it's like computational that? energy uh you know that that works toward a goal that would eventually give you a bitcoin or you know right some right. type of currency yeah because the, they they have to solve a very intensive algorithm and mm -hmm. if they do it first they get a coin. So they've got a computer running constantly trying to solve those algorithms and get those coins. That's why it's called oh, mining. Oh, so the power is coming from the power yeah. concerns are coming from those computers. From who the are use running. of the computers to do the right. algorithms that do I, the mining. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Got it. Wow. You solve, yeah. you, solve you, 
you solved everything for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and where I didn't, I didn't you know, where, that at all. Okay. You know, ten years ago, someone might have said, "Oh yeah, the, my extra bedroom." You know, I got a couple computers going. You know, to get some Bitcoin. I mean, I knew people like that, and now it's like, no, nah, you need like. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more energy because it takes a lot more because it's a finite number, right? So it's harder to mine. It was easier some time ago. Yeah, uh, but, but we'll, we'll keep an eye out for these 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 well balanced good uh, assessments of this because I know this is a piece of concern for a lot of people and there's a lot of fud around that's that's trying to sway you one way or another that it's it's perfectly safe which it's not or that it's it's going to ruin the earth which it probably isn't either. So it, it's good to see this kind of work yeah. out there. Well, speaking of a power struggle, hey, Google and Roku have been locked in a dispute over the terms under which they will agree to offer YouTube TV and the Roku app store. Now, remember that Google, excuse me, that YouTube TV is the service that gives you a cable TV like experience, so ABC, CBS, Bravo, et cetera. So to catch people up, this dispute is not about money. It's about promotional preference. So things like placement and search results promotion in the app store, device requirements, specifically AV1 decoding, and sharing user data. So because of the dispute, YouTube TV has not been available in the Roku app store since last Friday. Existing YouTube TV users can still use the app they have, but new users can't get it. And now Google has made a move. Users of the YouTube app, the regular YouTube app, on Roku will now see a Go to YouTube TV option, uh, show up in the next few days. Now, selecting the option will launch the YouTube TV experience if you're a YouTube TV subscriber. It does not offer a way to sign up for YouTube TV. Uh, Google has also told The Verge that it is in discussions with other partners to secure free streaming devices in case YouTube TV members face any access issues on, on Roku. Real quick, when I read that last, that, that, do they mean themselves? Because the, don't they have devices that <laughs> called Google TV that suddenly can become available for free if needed? Yeah, I, I mean, are they going to Apple and uh, they're going to give away some free Apple TVs? Probably not. Maybe maybe Amazon. Maybe they're working with Fire TV. My guess is yeah. it, it's it's Android TV and Google TV partners that that make those devices that they're like, hey, can can we do a deal? Where we give it, you know, we subsidize giving these out to a bunch of people. But it's we talked last Friday about the reason this happens to, with Roku so often is the lack of leverage because this is entirely Roku's business. They don't have a bunch of other businesses that they can use to throw their weight around. And here it is in 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 a, action. Google says, well, we do have a very popular app towards YouTube that we're betting you won't want to kick out of the App Store. So we'll put YouTube TV in there. Ha. Also, we make devices in competition with you. We will flood the market with free devices if you take any other moves. Uh, and so far, Roku's only response to this has been the boilerplate, like stuff that they were saying last week about Google being a monopolist, et cetera. Well, yeah. about an hour and a half ago, Roku did reiterate that statement, yeah. uh, put out a statement about this saying Google's actions are the clear conduct of an unchecked monopolist bent on crushing fair competition and harming consumer choice. The bundling announcement by YouTube highlights the kind of predatory business practices used by Google that Congress, attorney generals, that's how Roku said it, and regulatory bodies around the world are investigating. Yeah. In other words, the, almost word we're not going to pull the YouTube week. app, darn it. Yeah. No, they're not. That's all, all they're going to do is words uh, because they don't have the leverage. Yeah. Didn't I mean, they is, at one there point any way, hmm. is there any way to be able to somehow keep the sign in process to YouTube TV non functional inside the YouTube app? It w Roku wouldn't have access to that. You know, that would be something that Google would be controlling within the YouTube app. Yeah. So even if Roku wanted to mess it up, I don't think they can. My my guess is you Google wanted to do this without having to submit it through the App Store as an update, uh, and so there was probably a way that they could push a they could change a link that's called from a Google server without having to update the app. Whereas to put in yeah. a sign in process, you'd have to change the the app. You'd have, you'd probably have to. Mm. I, I'm just guessing, but my right, guess is you'd right. probably have to change the code, and then Roku in code review could say, "Oh wait, there's a problem here." And so they wanted. My guess is they wanted to avoid that, which is why they did it. But you can still go sign up for YouTube TV on the website, then download YouTube, and because your YouTube account and your YouTube TV account are the same, 
you'd, you'd be able to use it that way. So a new subscriber can work around it by doing that. Yeah, you can, you can even, uh, in a YouTube app, you can watch your Google Play movies, and t if they even call that. Right, right, you can anymore. already do that anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so. and Google says they're going to do this on other platforms that, that they don't have a dispute with, uh, which kind of makes sense to me. Like, it's called YouTube. I think a lot of people are confused about the difference, so why wouldn't you put YouTube TV inside the YouTube app anyway? Yeah, uh, you know, that was my first thought when I read this. You know, at first it was like, ooh, burn on Roku. And then I was like, <laughs> that actually makes more sense. Yeah. Then you're staying within YouTube ecosystem and all that much more. Well, I would like to give some props uh, and also give an idea for anybody who's looking for a weekend project. Props to Ryder Damon over at Tom's Hardware for turning an old rotary phone into a working Google Assistant with a Raspberry Pi Zero and a few USB and jumper cables. Damon goes into very careful detail, a lot of details here, step-by-step -step process, about the process, including registration and auth authentication with Google. There's kind of a lot going on. And even the old phone organ surgery part, which seems like the most fun part, right? You're taking apart an old phone and putting a Raspberry Pi in there, although Damon says in no uncertain terms, make sure you use a phone you don't care about. This will not work normally afterwards. <laughs> Once mm. the steps are successful, and there might be a little trial and error, you can pick up the phone and ask your Google Assistant something and get your answer and then hang up when you're done, because why not? Be like the olden times. Yeah. No, I, I love that because you're essentially gutting the phone and putting the Raspberry Pi in to act as Google Assistant. And the rest of it, you know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but the rest of it is just hooking up the phone's receiver, kids ask your parents, uh, to be the speaker and the mic. So you yeah. just you speak into one end and then lifting it up activates the mic. It's like using the wake word. So you don't even have to use the, if for people who don't want it listening all the time, that's actually kind of a cool way to do it, right? I, I wasn't even born when these phones were out. I have no idea what y'all talking about. Well, <laughs> that's because you're so much younger than us, Lamar. Uh, I know. Gosh. Five minutes. Oh, I will never forget it. Uh, by the way, if this is the kind of project you're into, Ryder Damon has quite a few Raspberry Pi projects. Uh, if you if you go over to Tom's Hardware and, and do a little search, you'll find them. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Somebody yeah. who likes to tinker is a friend of mine. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's check out the mailbag. We have any friends in there? We do. Today, our friend is Jason. Jason was talking about a conversation we were having yesterday about the idea that Apple isn't taking 30% uh, uh, of shows and movies on Netflix for each series or each particular movie. So why would they be doing that with games? This is, a, of course, you know, the Apple Epic case. Jason says the argument that Apple doesn't require Netflix to have a separate app for each show or movie, it goes further than you think. Netflix has streamed a game without a separate app, too. Black Mirror Bandersnatch streamed on the regular app, didn't it? It's an interactive medium where a player directs the character's choices. It even has a game over screens. Is that not a game? <laughs> Jason says Microsoft can mail the check care of me. Uh, yeah, to which I, I pointed out to Jason that the Apple TV version of Netflix didn't work with Bandersnatch uh, Choose Your Own. You had to stream it from your laptop. I don't think the iOS app worked either. And that explains why. You you, you cracked the case, Jason. Uh, <laughs> Netflix was probably like, oh, Apple won't let us do a game. Uh, so we can't do it on the Apple platform. It just makes this even more ridiculous to me. My goodness. <laughs> Well, thanks for the feedback, Jason. If you have any feedback for anything we talk about, anything we might talk about in the future, feedback at Daily Tech News Show, where to send that email. Thank you in advance. Also, a big shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Degracia A. Daniels, Chris Allen, and Michelle Sergio. Also, big, big special Friday thanks to Paul Boyer, who is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Paul, you're the best. Thank you for all the years of support. Also, Len Peralta has been along with us this entire time, illustrating today's show. Len, what have you drawn for us? Well, I, I went more conceptual with this, uh, with the Bitcoin uh, electricity. This, uh, in, uh, or not, or it's more energy consumption. Mm -hmm. This one's called BC Eats E, and uh, it depicts a big, angry Bitcoin sucking up all the electrical and everything else around it. It's sort of more conceptual than it is mm. funny, but it's very interesting. And I, you know, I found it, I found it interesting 
uh, to uh, to take it that route, I guess. Hopefully you guys do as well. I like it when you go editorial cartoon. This is good. Try to good try stuff. to be. Yeah. Yes. Um, this image was drawn live on Twitch today. Twitch TV uh, forward slash Len Peralta. You can also get it if you're a Patreon subscriber. Patreon.com dot com forward slash Len. Or if you're old school, you can go to my uh, online store, Len Peralta store dot com. Love it, Len. Great Thank stuff you. as always. Also great to have on the show is Lamar Wilson. Lamar, what hey. have you been up to since we saw you last? Well, you know, on TikTok, I've uh, they gave me a new nickname, and I've and I've decided to keep it. I've been called the CEO of unboxings. Mm. <laughs> Congratulations! So, and, I, and I was like, I was like, I like that. I, 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 there's, there's, the TikTok people are great. You know, I love the audience there. So yeah, I'm just doing a lot of unboxings. Got one coming up next week on uh, YouTube, big gaming uh, type of unboxing. I won't reveal what it is, but yeah, you can get all of my links at lamarwilson.com. Uh, and have Twitter, TikTok, and all that good stuff. So thank you for your support. I appreciate you all. Well, thank you for being here. We are live Monday through Friday on this here show at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back Monday with another fun-filled week of DTNS. Have a great weekend. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, and Jack Shid. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music provided by Martin Bell and Dan Luters. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Allison Sheridan, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Lamar Wilson. And guests on this week's show included Nate Langson and Dr. Nicole Ackermans. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>